Man, Amber Heard started. Try to relax your anus. It's time to talk about my man history. Man oh, history. Man history. Does your dog fall asleep at the very start? Then turn off the TV. And here's what you do. With an Atari game, a flick of the switch turns your TV set into a playground and your family room into a family room. Have you played Atari today? That's why I asked! Woo! Hi everybody, my name is Rich of Review Tech USA. I'm 42 years old, I still play video games, and I'm old as sh- I'm sorry. Now this is going to be an interesting video because it's not just going to be about my history with video games. I've talked about that before and, and filed it under who gives a crap kind of, but my age bracket is an interesting one because I wasn't there for the very inception of video games like Magnavox Odyssey days. Magnavox presents Odyssey, the electronic game of the future. Odyssey easily attaches to any brand TV, black and white or color, to create a closed circuit electronic playground. Odyssey gives you all the exciting action of hockey and 11 other challenging play and learning games for the entire family. Odyssey, a new dimension for your television. Now at your Magnavox dealer. He's listed in the yellow pages. But I was young enough at the time where I was born at a time when video games were just it was a fledgling market so I grew up with games and saw the ups and downs and saw the industry evolve and change and that's why I thought this video would be a good one to make because my story kind of ties in with the industry if that makes sense which I think it does so my first lucid memory uh with gaming was going with my dad to whatever toy shop we went to. We lived in Pelham, New York at the time. And this was after the video game crash. I believe it was 1984. I would have to check with my dad, but he probably wouldn't know either because it was such a long time ago. Uh. And after the crash for a while, basically until the NES came on the scene, when it came to console gaming in the States, you couldn't give away consoles after the crash. My mother's very proud. I mean, you had bargain bins of, of, of games and, and ColecoVisions and other hardware because everyone thought gaming was over. Everyone thought it was a gimmick. So my dad, who was having a business meeting with one of his partners, we were driving by this shop and he picked up, it was a, I guess it was a used ColecoVision. If you own ColecoVision, you already own a powerful state-of-the-art computer that gives you the arcade experience with the newest arcade games like Donkey Kong Jr., Looping, Pepper 2, Time Pilot, Mr. Do, Space Fury, Frontline, arcade controls like Turbo, the Roller Controller, and new Super Action Sports. And soon you'll plug in Adam, the revolutionary ColecoVision family computer module with new Super Games, keyboard, and printer. ColecoVision, the only system you'll ever need. Because I remember vividly it was in, like they, they shrink wrapped it. It wasn't in the original box. And it came with a copy of Donkey Kong. And I just remember being enamored with it. I also remember playing a game on the ColecoVision called, it was by Taito called Frontline. Man, the ColecoVision, it actually had a controller pretty much like this. Kind of like the uh, Intellivision Amico was going to have too. My mother's very proud. At least in shape. And it had the numbered keypad. That was a thing back in the 80s. And it had zero ergonomics. But I still absolutely love playing games on there. Also, another memory that I have too is with the Atari 2600. But I remember going back and forth between the Coleco and the 2600. <laughs> and... Uh, shout out to my dad. He was pirating games before people knew what the hell piracy really was. He actually had a cart that he made where it had a slot on it that you could actually, he, what he would do is copy the ROMs from Atari games and 
he would make the, he would make a duplicate chip and he made a cartridge where it had where you could slot in these chips that he would copy from the original game the rom and he had a whole bunch of pirated games <laughs> on these different chips and it, i remember playing the atari 2600 i remember playing pitfall was one of the pirated games that we had there was plenty of others too but that was my beginning with gaming playing pirated games my dad was pirating back in the 80s so oops you blew it fish <sighs> but what really cemented uh my love for games was christmas of 1986 and that is when I got a Nintendo Entertainment System. Or back in the 80s and 90s, uh, you just called the NES the Nintendo. Will you be the one to witness the birth of the incredible Nintendo Entertainment System? The one to play with Rob, the extraordinary video robot, batteries not included. He helps you tackle even the toughest challenge. Will you be the first to raise the incredibly accurate Zapper and play games like Duck Hunt or action-packed Hogan's Alley and high-flying Kung Fu, each sold separately? Will you be the one to experience the Nintendo Entertainment System? Comes with Rob, Zapper, Control Deck, two controllers, Gyromite, and Duck Hunt. Now that Christmas, I got two big gifts. The Nintendo Entertainment System, that was the Rob the Robot bundle. <laughs> yeah, that's how long we're going back. And my zapper was gray, okay? that So that's how OG it was, and that's how old I am. And I also got the doll that sang. It actually had a cassette deck in it that was like bleeding edge tech for a, a doll to have called Teddy Ruxpin. Show and tell time. Another teddy bear? My teddy's name is Teddy Ruxpin. He talks, he tells stories, he... Four batteries not included. Hi, my name is Teddy Ruxpin. Can you and I be friends? Yeah. I really enjoy talking to people. I would like you. Teddy Ruxpin, the storytelling bear, comes with illustrated book and cassette from Worlds of Wonder. And the tape would have audio, and it also had something on there that would make the mouth move. Needless to say, I, it would, I got two of them. They were broken. I lost interest in five minutes and became obsessed with the Nintendo Entertainment System. Not really Rob the Robot, though. I used to actually play Gyromite by just having two NES controllers. I was Rob the Robot and was fat with a mullet. Girls. 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 But the Nintendo Entertainment System revitalized the industry. It, it essentially saved console gaming in the States. And in my opinion, even though the crash of 1983 with gaming was a United States thing and a, and a console thing, I really think Nintendo being successful in the States reverberated throughout the world and really helped the gaming industry evolve. So now you have the Nintendo Entertainment System, which was a huge step up from the Atari 2600 and, and even the Coleco. I'm not going to put it in a bottle and breastfeed it to you. I was about to say the Coleco Chameleon. <laughs> And it was a big step up from the ColecoVision as well. And I remember that Christmas getting games like Kung Fu, which I absolutely loved. And Mario Brothers Balloon Fight was fantastic. I had for the NES. I just couldn't get enough of it. And Nintendo on the industry side proved that, yeah, people want consoles. There's something, there's an ease of use to just putting a cartridge in a piece of hardware and the game just playing. Now, during this time period, really Nintendo, in a way, had a monopoly on the market. There was the Sega Master System uh, that was a competitor, but Nintendo was top dog. And everyone kind of thought about the Nintendo Entertainment System as this permanent piece of hardware. That's really my point with this. And there was an interesting clip I'm going to show now where a lot of people didn't understand generations. Our video game industry is hotter than ever this season, and one good reason, Nintendo has introduced some hot new toys. But have things gone a bit too far? This evening, Ken Shockney wraps up a special report on Videomania. 
that this really had to cost this much. Where should the anger be directed? Not at the parents, but at the, what, the manufacturer. Does it so it has come to this, this therapy exactly. sessions for families whom you could call Nintendent. First of all, the peer pressure starts. I feel maybe exploited. <laughs> Psychologists' offices might get more crowded this holiday season. Just in time for Christmas, the Japanese toy maker Nintendo has come out with a new set of electronic video games. At $200, a Super Nintendo setup costs twice as much as the old system, and you can't mix and match. Some parents are refusing to be taken in. I'm going to say no, and I'm going to explain to him how people market things to make you spend more money. Nintendo controls 80% of the video market, though some game players prefer the pictures of its competitor, Sega. But no matter how you play the game, or which game you play, Things definitely have come a long way since Pac-Man. Ken Shocknick, Channel 4 News. Now, look, we had the Atari 2600. They had, the, remember, the 5200 that was should have had a zip code. Just look at it. Look at how huge this beast is. It's ginormous. And why is there a door on it? Is this a video game console or a f oh. closet? And yes, companies were already making more powerful hardware like kind of generational upgrades. But Nintendo and Sega were the first mainstream companies, especially Nintendo. The Master System didn't really do anything in the States. But the Sega Genesis says hello. What's the hottest 16-bit video game system with true arcade games, great graphics, real challenge, stereo sound, and the hottest library too with games like Altered Beast, Golden Axe, Super Hang-On, Forgotten World, Space Harrier 2, Revenge of Shinobi, Tommy Lasorda Baseball, Buxton, Last Battle, Arnold Palmer Tournament Golf, Super Thunder Blade, Zoom, Thunder Force 2, Fools and Ghosts, Mystic Defender, Rambo 3, and more, Genesis from Sega. Genesis, the new generation in video games. Where they were saying, look, you, this piece of hardware that you have is something that's going to become dated. It's not like your CD player. It's not like your VCR. It's something where the technology is constantly evolving and changing. And when you saw the Sega Genesis and Super Nintendo, you realize that the companies were right. Parents hated it because it meant they had to spend more money. But yeah, the technology kept moving and moving. The Nintendo hardware and the Sega Master System hardware got more dated. And as the software evolved and hardware evolved, the older consoles couldn't handle what developers wanted to do. And when you saw how capable the next gen consoles were, I will never forget seeing Revenge of Shinobi's intro for the first time. <laughs> see that compared to the NES and Sega Master System. I almost crapped my pants when I saw it. And yes, again, I did have a mullet. Breastfeeded. 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 But it was interesting at the time. The companies knew that they had to sell on horsepower or they thought that the consumer wanted to be sold on horsepower. If you really think about it, look at the marketing back then. 16-bit. The original Sega Genesis, the Model 1, I actually have one right over there. Why don't I go get it? Why am I being a fat, lazy bastard? I'll be right back. We looked at the logs. Shout out to DK Oldies who knew they were sending me one and send me the cleanest Sega Genesis possible because they knew a YouTuber was going to get one. Is DK Oldies a scam? No. But look at the flex here. It was about processing power, and this was the marketing gimmick. 16-bit with the Sega Genesis. This is the Model 1 with the headphone jack. Then you go look at the TurboGrafx-16, which in Japan was called the PC Engine. Totally different name. But again, it included 16-bit because everyone knew the older consoles' processors were 8-bit processors. The Z80 was in the Sega Master System. This, the Nintendo Entertainment System had the 6502 processor. So virtually all the consumers, or 98% of them, had no idea what bits were, but they did know 16 is a bigger number than eight. And then you would see commercials from 
NEC for the TurboGrafx-16 showing China Warrior. Bocharge games like China Warrior. Compare it to Nintendo's Kung Fu. Can you spot the difference? TurboGrafx-16 has 16-bit graphics that make characters up to 32 times bigger and almost 10 times as many colors. Turbo Action, Turbo Sound, TurboGrafx-16, the higher energy video game system. TurboGrafx-16 video game system is available at these stores. You would see commercials for the Super Nintendo or the SNES showing Super Mario World and how many colors they can have on screen. And then you would see Genesis from Sega showing before the Super Nintendo was out what the Sega Genesis was capable of. So now we're at a point, and this is the point I'm trying to make, where the consumer has become adjusted, I guess you could say is the right word, to generation. What's that? Mm. Optic nerve, this is the brain. What's going on down there? Uh... The airdrop's going up! Go get him! We're having a breakdown, 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 we're having a breakdown! We're having a breakdown. Ah! What else can go wrong? Surgeon Synapse on line two, it's the sphincter. What is going on up there? Sigaturn. They knew about every five years there was going to be a new piece of hardware because technology evolves, so the hardware has to evolve. So after we went from the Super Nintendo and Sega Genesis, we went on to the next generation, which would be considered the fifth generation of consoles where Sony entered the race with the PlayStation 1. And it was at this point, if you really think about it, what's interesting is I have this huge outline here and I'm not even going by it. I'm just babbling and it's working. Congratulations. Okay, you you do I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll tell you what. Endure. Um, we were beginning to see where hardware was becoming more than just gaming, where the industry was evolving. Two things happened during the fifth generation. One, was that your Sega Saturn, which bombed, and your Sony PlayStation were also capable of playing CDs. They were becoming multimedia devices, which in turn was basically the beginning of the evolution or we were evolving into what hardware and gaming is becoming now, where you could have devices that do more than one thing. And also during this generation, another very interesting thing happened people started to download mp3s when it really whips the llama's ass i remember the first mp3 i downloaded was on a pentium one that was running at a blazing fast 60 megahertz and it was a castlevania symphony of the night song and this was the song that i downloaded via mp3 <laughs> But it wasn't just about, oh my God, now we could just download songs. It was showing what the internet was capable of. I downloaded that over a 28.8 kbps, I think that's the data transfer rate, dial-up modem. And it was showing not just with music how it was going to be distributed digitally and people weren't going to buy it physically anymore. It was showing how just anything we consume is just gonna be purchased or leased or rented or subscription service and everything's gonna be downloaded or streamed digitally. And it was beginning back then. Now let's step into the seventh generation of consoles. Hello, and my name is Kim. I'm here to start you on a journey into the future of entertainment. It's a future where I am always at the center of a world of experiences that include my games, and my friends. That future starts right here, right now. Yeah. <laughs> 
This is my Xbox 360. It's here and it's on. And that, what I just talked about, evolved even more with your PlayStation 3, especially throughout the generation, with your 360, especially throughout the generation. They weren't just simply devices that played games where you popped a disc in. Sony was flexing with the PlayStation 3 that not only were you getting the most powerful gaming console of the generation, you were also getting the most affordable, in the beginning, Blu-ray player. So the PlayStation 3 was meant from inception they thought they were going to have the same thing happen with the playstation 2 a lot of people bought the playstation 2 just to play dvds on it they thought the same thing was going to happen with the playstation 3 with blu-ray blu-ray did win out but it wasn't it, it didn't take over like dvd did because at this time leading into what i'm really getting into here people were moving on to downloading and streaming music even back then so blu-ray never had the same impact but getting back to the hardware your ps3 your 360 even the wii the wii had netflix on it they were becoming devices that weren't just simply consoles they were entertainment media hubs and basically pcs now what's funny is this is actually the seventh generation i mean to say was the generation that actually got me back into gaming in my late 20s. Uh, I remember getting a tax return uh, from, I, I was working a relatively new job or very new job and I'm like, you know what? I saw the commercial for Gears of War. Y you remember that commercial? I can't really play it here. The music's copyrighted or maybe I will and I'll put my own music over it. <laughs> I like big dicks. And I'm like, man, that game looks cool. Whoa, <laughs> that's cool. So I went out and bought that 360 and I bought Gears of War. And I remember that was the first time I saw an HD game and I almost crapped my pants. And another thing I did, seeing the all digital future that we're going into, I bought Martin Scorsese's The Departed and downloaded it to the Xbox 360 hard drive and watched it. This is in 2007. Now, one thing I forgot to mention, and this was a huge thing about the seventh generation, I'm glad I remembered to talk about it, is this is when DLC and downloading games became not the norm, but started to become a regular thing. Now, I remember on the Xbox Live Arcade downloading Castlevania Symphony of the Night, and it was a big deal because Xbox Live Arcade at the time had a size limit and they actually had to take out some things in terms of like cutscenes and compress the audio more to get Castlevania Symphony of the Night to be able to be downloaded on Xbox Live Arcade, but it was a big deal. And thinking back on that now, it was like the moment when I downloaded an MP3 during the fifth generation of consoles on my PC. I started to see where we were going in the future when I downloaded Castlevania. Now this started in the sixth generation, but it really ramped up during the seventh generation. If you remember with the original Xbox, that's when Microsoft introduced Xbox Live. <laughs> It's good to play together. 
the original Halo. I remember going to LAN parties with my friends after work, which were awesome. Um, did not have Xbox Live. You could only play local multiplayer. Halo 2, because Xbox Live became a thing, actually had online multiplayer. No enemy has ever withstood our might. I need a weapon. Rated M for mature. And that's another thing we saw begin to happen. And it's interesting in the beginning how it's it just like, wow, this is so like I couldn't wrap my mind playing SOCOM 2 on the PlayStation 2 that I'm playing with people that could be on the other side of the world. I mean, now it's like, OK, Rich, what's the big deal? But back then, back in the early 2000s, that was something that just blew your mind. I remember playing Lord of the Rings Return of the King, which had online co-op with some kid, and he told me that I sucked. That's a true story. I'm like, man, the internet's awesome. Online gaming is awesome. Lord, I, if I only knew what I was in store for. Flashback. Ooh, oh, oh yeah. Now getting back to the seventh generation, especially with Call of Duty and Halo. That's when Halo was in its prime with Halo 3. Online gaming, especially on the 360, Sony was still playing catch up. The nice thing about the PS3 at that time was you didn't have to pay to play online. That was their selling point. That changed with the eighth generation with the PS4. This is how you share your games on PS4. Thanks. But back then, you could play games online on the PS3 and you didn't have to pay to do it. But it was during the seventh generation that online gaming became huge and companies saw that there was an opportunity there. Hey, you could buy a new map pack for Call of Duty or Halo or other accessories. John Riccatello was during this generation with Battlefield 3 was like, hey, we should make them pay to get more bullets. It could be DLC. You want to reload the clip in your gun? <laughs> Buy more bullets and you could download them to your clip. Think about that. In substantial portion of digital revenues are microtransactions. When you are six hours into playing Battlefield and you run out of ammo in your clip and we ask you for a dollar to reload, you're really not very price sensitive at that point in time. Um, and for what it's worth, the cogs on the clip really low. And so um, essentially what ends up happening, and the reason the, the play first, pay later model works so nicely, is a consumer gets engaged in a property. They might spend 10, 20, 30, 50 hours on the game. And then when they're deep into the game, they're well invested in it. We're not gouging, but we're charging. And at that point in time, the commitment can be pretty high. So, Personal anecdote, I spent about $5,000 calendar year to date on doing just this thing, this type of thing on our products and others. Um, I can readily attest to uh, how well it works. Um, but it is a, it's a great model, and I think it represents a, a substantially better future for the industry. And I remember during this time, and I thought it was an exciting novel concept, and it was. Little did I know how it was going to be extorted and used by gaming executives. GTA 4 had two expansions, The Lost and the Damned and The Ballad of Gay Tony. And I'm like, man, this is so cool. If you have a game, which at the time they were completed generally, and you want more of that great game granted i'm not a huge grand theft auto guy but i think that's great if there's a game that i love that comes out and they want to give dlc like fear 2 i bought the dlc for that if you want more of it hey that's not a bad thing right then companies realized how much money they can make off dlc and you would start getting a bunch of map packs and you would start getting skins for your guns and then they would put other things behind paywalls and then you realized oh god Ah! 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 
Oh my God. Stop! So it started off as a innocent, nice concept. And of course, corporate greed made it slowly slide downhill, which kind of sort of leads us to today. And it's also things are changing too from a hardware perspective. We're in very weird times. Now let's go over to the eighth generation of consoles. TV experience, TV, TV and movies, TV, Xbox, watch TV, 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 TV. <laughs> TV, TV, watch TV, it's TV, TV, TV remote, TV experience, TV, 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 sports TV, TV, TV. Anybody? No. One of the big things we saw there, not Sony really, but Microsoft, Sony later on started to with like Horizon Zero Dawn, where they were like, yeah, we want our games everywhere. Gears 4 will also be one of the first titles in the new Xbox program, Xbox Play Anywhere. This icon means when you buy the game digitally, you get to own it and play it on both Xbox One and Windows 10 PC. And that's with your progress and your achievements saved on Xbox Live, and shared across both platforms, all at no additional cost to you. That conventional concept of every five years you need a new piece of hardware and games for consoles were only on consoles and games for handhelds were only handheld games. Yeah, we're gonna muddy the waters there. You could play our games on your PC. And it was like, wait, you're de-incentivizing people from buying your hardware and there's still a valid argument to be made like if look if i could get these games everywhere why should i buy your hardware but i think microsoft did see that we were going towards games as a service future and they were right now look what Sony's doing. They just announced that Ghost of Tsushima is coming to PC and it was also during the eighth generation even though it's kind of Nintendo's ninth generation console. Forgot to talk about the Wii U. The Wii U was a bomb. There you go. That's the Wii U. Oh yeah! The Macho Man's gonna eat your ass! <laughs> oh yeah! But it did not do well for Nintendo. But Nintendo during the eighth generation technically dropped their ninth generation console, the Switch, which was getting AAA games you never thought would be imaginable on a portable device. I remember playing, and I know a lot of you heard this story, uh, playing Doom 2016 on a handheld, now it's like there's a billion. You could get the Steam Deck, ROG Ally, any INEO, GPD Win, and play AAA games all day. But back in 2017, it was just a mind-blowing concept that now we're once again used to playing AAA games that were the same games, obviously with less graphical fidelity, like Doom 2016, like Doom Eternal, like Witcher 3, which is also on the Switch, you're playing those games on the go and they're not cut down versions like when you had a 3DS or a Game Boy. And Nintendo with the Switch, now especially during the ninth generation of consoles, has opened the door up for things like the Steam Deck, which now is... <laughs> If you have a Steam account, a ton of games are playable on the Steam Deck. And then if you get a Windows-based device like the ROG Ally or, like I said, Ioneo's devices or GPD Win or whoever, you could play virtually all your games, especially now with how capable integrated graphics are on AMD processors especially, you're taking your entire library, the same exact games, not cut down versions like they would make for like the 2DS and Vita and Game Boy Advance. You're playing the same games you'll be playing on your PC on the go, unadulterated. Again, minus you have to cut down the visuals. So it was during this eighth generation and now this generation, that we're at this weird turning point and it's been amazing to see it's been amazing to see how we went from, in my lifetime, the gaming industry almost dying in 83 to being completely reinvigorated by Nintendo in 85 slash 86 to now be in 2024. And it seems like the gaming industry, they're making plans, but they don't know what's going to work. We see Warner Brothers moving away from AAA games to live service games with 
The Suicide Squad killed the Justice League. Yeah, good luck with that one. And now we're seeing layoffs in the industry and we see Sony, Microsoft especially, and I'm sure Nintendo is gonna have the struggle too, of where the industry is going. Our console is gonna continue to be necessary. It's not cloud gaming I'm talking about. Thank God. I, I'm just not... I don't want cloud gaming to be our future. I don't. Hi, I'm looking for... Stadia? What? Cucumbers. But with all these devices with powerful integrated hardware, it's becoming a tougher sell for companies to say, hey, buy our console. Or you could buy this device, which, yeah, okay, the games won't look as good. Sometimes. And you could take your games on the go and you could play the same exact games and then you could dock your console and play those games at home. So that keeps me away from consoles. Also too, when you have games, like I just said before, they announced Ghost of Tsushima for, for PC. It's gonna come out on Steam. There's other games like Horizon, Zero Dawn, God of War. You could all get Spider-Man, Spider-Man, Miles Morales. You could get those on PC as well, which were PlayStation exclusives. We're in this place where I don't know if anyone knows what the next move is. And growing up where everything was so straightforward and compartmentalized, you knew a console every five-ish year, five, it could be four to seven years, let's say, would come out. If you wanted to play games on the go, you would buy a dedicated console from Sony or Nintendo or whoever. And that's how you would play your portable games and you knew they would be totally different because the hardware was limited. Now we're in this place where if you have like an AMD processor with RDNA 2 graphics or better, even if it's not meant to be a gaming device, it's a gaming, it's a gaming PC. My point being is that there's not this walled garden around hardware to play games anymore. And I just don't know if Sony and Microsoft and Nintendo know what the next step is. Microsoft seems like they're preparing themselves the most with all the studios they're buying. We know they bought Activision, Blizzard, and Bethesda, and countless other studios because I think they want to have all those games. They want to be the Netflix of gaming, but even with how much money they put into it, is it inevitable that they're going to become the Netflix of gaming? Now, Sony on the flip side, they don't have the bottomless pockets that Microsoft does, but they have very strong first party IPs, but you're bringing those to PC or trickling them on, I should say, to PC as well. So that's diluting the reason to have a PlayStation. So what is the future for these consoles? It used to be that their hardware and you would buy games for their hardware and they, a lot of times they would sell the consoles at a loss and they would make the money up with game licensing and accessories. If we're moving away from that, what's gonna happen? Sony can't, like I said, buy out a bunch of companies like Microsoft did. Are they just going to fold and put their game under Microsoft's umbrella? Is Microsoft's strategy of being games as a service going to work out? And they're already talking about their next-gen console being the most powerful console ever. But who's going to want to buy your console if they could play your games in a billion different ways on a billion different pieces of hardware? So we're kind of at a turning point here. We also see that the industry is retracting. There's countless layoffs throughout the entire gaming industry. I think everyone got fat and happy, no pun intended, during the pandemic. And now the reality of the uncertain future of gaming is sobering people up, and here we are. And I've been here for a lot of it, and to see all of these changes in real time and growing up to see the industry evolve into what it is, and to see it kind of have its own midlife crisis is interesting. Review Midlife Crisis USA. The industry has plans, but are they going to work out? I have plans as well, but are they going to work out? This is Rich with Review Tech USA signing out. Have a good one.